stream on you know these guys uh, so I, I don't know I mean for how many cases this has been done but for example for when exists the classical modular curve or the Klein portic I mean this this has has been done um, so actually in these special cases this uniformization map is always expressed in terms of periods uh, so uh, with periods I just mean integrals of, of, of this form so you're integrating some uh, algebraic top form over some cycle uh, and then uh, this map f we're looking for uh, typically is some quotient of two periods so so it will depend on x which lives in your algebraic curve uh, and you get this function by integrating some algebraic top form uh, with some extra variable so geometrically typically in these examples even if we're integrate interested in some algebraic curve x it turns out that in order to find this uniformization map uh, for these special cases you use some auxiliary family over x so i don't want to go into some details just use this as some some motivation but you can think of the case when x is the modular curve so moduli space of elliptic curves and then you have your universal family of elliptic curves over x so you get your x by just integrating some classical top form like this one along uh, the two cycles of the fiber uh, and because this is this top form is changing with with the with the base x you get the map and it turns out that this is really the embedding into uh, the upper half plane and once you have that you can pull back the the hyperbolic standard metric and get uh, uh, and get uh, an expression for your keller einstein metric in this very special case then so i mean this i will just use this as an analogy analogy later on so it will be part of the entertainment somehow uh, okay uh, and in high dimension i mean as far as i know there are very few few explicit results i think there's some work by dolin mosto but in general it's intractable okay so so let's think about some a relaxed problem so you want to find some canonical sequence of keller metrics which approximate the keller einstein metric uh, in such a way that at each level k so k will tend to infinity at level k the canonical approximation should be encoded by the algebraic structure of x so that's a more reasonable goal uh, so to be more precise, what we'd like is that, is that the canonical approximation at level k should be encoded by the canonical ring of x in the sense that the level k then comes from the degree k component, the space of pluricanonical forms of degree k. Okay, so this is actually part of the motivation of the whole Yao Tian Donaldson conjecture uh, where you want to approximate some differential geometric objects in terms of uh, some algebraic geometric objects and stability uh, and so forth. But I will move, go on in another direction, which is that I've been working on for, for some years now. Uh, so I will explain a probabilistic approach uh, to Keller Einstein metric that actually leads to a canonical sequence of, 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 of metrics approximating the, the Keller Einstein metric. And the funny thing is that this like naturally leads to an expression for this canonical approximation as a period integral. But the integral is over some uh, n-fold product uh, of, of x, actually a symmetric product of x, uh, which is encoded by the canonical ring. Uh, so, so this, all of that will actually work. And I, I mean, I've worked on that for. Uh, for, for a couple of some years, it was completed some, some years ago. But the, the really challenging problem then is, is to understand what's going on in the case of fan varieties. So I will, I will come to that uh, later on. Uh, because in the fan case, there are, turns out to be some really intriguing relations to, to the Yao Tian Donaldson conjecture, to zeta functions, and even to the theory of phase transitions in, in statistical mechanics. Uh, but the problems look really hard, even though I have some few new results I want to mention. Okay, so stay tuned. Uh, so I will start to explain the probabilistic approach to Kelanstein metrics in the case when the canonical line bundle is positive. And then you'll see that everything works really smoothly. 
Okay, so before we get started, I mean, we're going to use the basic fact that uh, the Kelleinstein metric is really, I mean, can really be recovered from its volume form because the Kelleinstein equation really tells us that uh, uh, once you have the, the volume form, you just take dd bar of log of that locally, and that will give you the, the, the Keller, the Kelleinstein metric. So we can really focus on the, on the volume form. So that we just need to reconstruct the volume form and then we'll be, be done. Okay, so then the idea is that we will show that there is a canonical way of choosing n points on x at random so that we really get equidistribution towards the, the, the Kelleinstein volume form almost surely because so what I'm saying is that and I mean, there's no way of choosing these points canonically in a deterministic way. So there are no special points, but I'm telling you that there is a way of, of defining randomness. So when I choose a random configuration of points, they will tend to be equidistributed on the volume form of the Kelleinstein metric. Okay, so to make this precise, we first need to define a canonical probability measure, DPN, on the n full product of x. And we need it to be symmetric because we want to choose configurations of points. And also we want it to be encoded by the canonical ring. Okay, so to this end, we'll take n to be a particular sequence. So nk will be the plurigenera, the dimensions of the space of, of pluricanonical forms. Uh, and because we're assuming that kx is ample, nk tends to infinity. Okay. Uh, okay, so how do I define the probability measure? Okay, so let's just pick a basis, alpha one of x to alpha n of x in the space of pluricanonical forms at level k. Uh, and then I define the determinant, which will be a pluricanonical form on the n-fold product. So remember, oops, n, k. Uh, so what I do is that I just first multiply the base elements. So that object now lives on the n-fold product of x, but then I do complete anti-symmetrization. Uh, so that's why I call it the determinant. It's the determinant. Uh, okay, so that's good. We now have an algebraic form that I call alpha on the n-fold product if we take the kth root, because this, this uh, we really need to get something which is a, is a form uh, on x to the nk. That's why we take the kth root because we want to get rid of this k here. Okay, so that's a, an algebraic form. Uh, well, it's complex, it's multivalued. So, but to get a real object, which is well-defined, we just take wedge, alpha wedge alpha bar. So that's now an honest positive real top form on the n-fold product. It's symmetric because alpha was anti-symmetric. When we take the, the bar, we get something which is symmetric. So that's good. So let's just define this uh, canonical probability measure uh, as alpha wedge alpha bar, and then uh, divide by the normalizing constant. So, th so this, this constant is just the integral over the n-fold product of alpha wedge alpha bar. So, okay, so maybe first I th should say that I never put the powers of i here because the formulas look ugly. So you, you should just, uh, think of the bar as being defined so that I don't have to put the, the powers of i here to get the real object. Okay, so that's a probability measure, which is symmetric, uh, but is it really canonical? Uh, because we really need to be sure that this object is independent of the choice of basis uh, in the space of pluricanonical forms. So remember, I, I used alpha one of, of x1 and, and wedged them together. But that actually works, right? Because if I change a basis uh, in the space, in this vector space, then this determinant just gets multiplied by, by a complex number, the determinant of the change of basis. Uh, and that's independent of the points. So when I divide by the normalizing constant, that uh, dependence goes away. Okay, so that's good news. It's really canonical. Uh, uh, it's all we want. We have the way of sampling endpoints on the unfold product. Uh, of sampling endpoints on X. Okay, so the main theorem then in probabilistic language is a 
I consider this random measure. So this is a random measure because it depends on the choice of random points. Each time I choose n random points, I see this discrete empirical measure. Uh, and the theorem says that when n tends to infinity, it converges uh, towards the Kelleinstein volume form in probability. So actually the result is, 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 is more precise. What it says is that the probability that the distance of this discrete measure, oops, no, something here, let's see, yeah, the, the, the probability that the distance of the discrete to this measure uh, to the, and the Kelleinstein volume form is larger than epsilon is exponentially smaller when n tends to infinity. So that means that with overwhelming probability, if we choose this point at points at random, they would really look like the volume form of the Kelleinstein metric. Okay, so let's try to extract something more con concrete from that uh, statement. So uh, what I can do is that I can find a sequence of canonical volume forms that live on X. We really want to focus on X, not the n-fold product. By just taking the expectation of this random empirical measure here. Uh, it means that I just take the average over all configurations where the notion of average is, is, is not defined by the canonical probability measure. That turns out to actually be a volume form on X. It's an average of discrete objects, which turns out to be a, a volume form. And the convergence in probability implies in particular that this sequence of volume forms converge towards the volume form of the Keller-Einstein metric. Okay, so now we can come back to the periods to, uh, to make some uh, connections with the classical setting. So this sequence of canonical volume forms uh, can be explicitly obtained as follows. So look at the n-fold product of x, which I think of as vibration over x. If I just map uh, a configuration of points to the first coordinate, okay? Uh, I have a canonical probability measure up here on the n-fold pro product. If I want to get an object on x, I can just push forward that measure to get the probability measure on x. Uh, and if you do that, it turns out that what you get is actually the, the expectation I wrote down before. Uh, but we also have an explicit formula because the probability measure dpn is just built from alpha wedge alpha bar. And the push forward means that we're integrating away uh, all but the first coordinate. Okay, but alpha is an algebraic top form. Uh, it's the, the, the kth root of the determinant, which is an algebraic uh, uh, form. Uh, so this is a sort of generalized period integral. And, and Z is also an integral of, of alpha. So uh, this canonical volume form is indeed the quotient of two periods which is sort of reminiscent of what happened in the very classical case of the modular curve, for example. So the funny thing here is that somehow, even if you're not interested in, in probability, but I'm sure of course you are, but if you're not, then you can think of that as some auxiliary tool, which uh, allows you to get the vibration over X and then push forward all the objects to X to get some canonical objects on X. Uh, okay. Uh, so, we really going to want to get the canonical sequence of Keller forms, but then we can use the standard trick. We just take the IDD bar of the logarithm of, 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 the, of the volume form, so that the corresponding curve, I mean, that's the corresponding curvature form. Uh, and the convergence of the, of the volume forms implies convergence at the level of Keller metrics. So, so this omega k, this canonical sequence of Keller metrics converge towards the Kelleinstein uh, metric. Uh, okay, uh, and if, so this canonical Keller metric is actually explicitly given by, by this expression we have. So, so again, it becomes a, a quotient of two periods, uh, which is a funny sort of amusing uh, relation to the classical setting. Have a, uh, okay, so let's move on. To can I ask question. a question? Yeah. Uh, so is it, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. is it known that is indeed a metric that is a positive definite, uh, this uh, IDD bar of logarithm? Good point. Yeah, yeah. So that's a good, 
good question. It turns out, yeah. So it, that turns out to be very simple. So it's really positive definite. What is non-trivial is that it will also be positive definite in the Fano case, but that's for a highly non-trivial fact using some positivity of, of direct images. We'll come back to that maybe. Uh, but this turns out to be for simple reason. I can just say, so locally alpha will be e to the phi where phi is locally uh, is dd bar phi bigger than one. So this is just logarithm of the integral of e to the psh. So that's always psh and then you see it's strictly positive as well. I see, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so that turns out to be to be uh, direct. But I swept that under the rug. In the, okay. Uh, okay, so let's move on to, to fan varieties, which is really uh, my main focus these days. Um, so we're now considering the opposite case. So I assume that the anti-canonical bundle is positive. Um, and again, let's assume X is, is non-singular for, for simplicity, even if that's not really important for, for the setup. Uh, so then a Kelly-Einstein metric now must have positive Ritchie curvature. Um, but as I'm sure most of you know, there are now obstructions to the existence of a Keller-Einstein metric. So according to the Yautian Donaldson conjecture, which is now a theorem, uh, X admits a Keller-Einstein metric if and only if X is k-stable. Uh, so k-stability here is a GIT type uh, stability condition that, I mean, there, there's been other talks about that. So I'm not going into that point of view. I will then instead focus on the probabilistic point of view. Um, so then uh, let me remind you that when kx was positive, I defined my probability measure in this explicit way. So the determinant here was built by, oops, <laughs> built by, by, by from elements of the space of global sections, h0, uh, with values in kx. So if minus k is positive, then of course these spaces are trivial. So we, uh, so we just, the determinant is just zero. So that's not going to be uh, very helpful. Uh, so what we need to do, of course, is to replace, to just use the minus k here. We're going to work with, with these spaces with a minus, uh, and we can still define the determinant. But then if we want to get the, uh, 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 something which transforms as a measure, who really forced to replace the mine one over k with minus one over k, okay? Because we, because if the determinant is built from anti-pluricanonical form, what we, to get uh, a top form, we really need to get the, take a minus here. Okay, uh, why not? Let's go. Uh, so I now just copy the previous setup with this modification. I let nk be the dimension uh, of these spaces here, which tends to infinity because minus kx is ample. And then I define the determinant with the minus sign here. Okay, so if, if you remember, if I still use notation, notation alpha as the determinant one over k, which is now a anti-canonical uh, object, then I can write my, the density of the probability measure then as the inverse uh, of alpha. Okay, great. So let's just go on, but there is one uh, issue now because the normalizing constant, uh, this total integral may very well be equal to infinity, right? Because alpha uh, will have uh, zero locus there will be a divisor kept out by alpha. And if that is too singular, then we're in trouble. Okay, but that we can turn that into an advantage because there has to be some obstructions. So maybe this is the obstruction. Uh, so the conjecture then is that if we assume that this normalizing constant is, is uh, finite, uh, then X does admit a unique Keller-Einstein metric and we recover it as before by sampling random points. So conversely, if X admits unique Keller-Einstein metric, we'd expect these normalized constants to be finite. 
because morally, from the probabilistic point of view, the reason X should emit, emit Kalanstein metric is that it can be constructed in this way. So, but for that, we need the normalizing constant to be finite. So that's uh, the conjecture. Uh, right. So let's look at this condition of the finiteness of the normalizing constant. Uh, that's actually a purely algebraic condition because if we define the anti-canonical divisor dk on the unfold product, uh, then this finiteness condition just means that uh, dk has mild singularities in the usual sense of irrational geometry. Uh, so it's KLT. Okay, so by definition, that means that the log canonical threshold uh, of the divisor on the unfold product is strictly bigger than, than one. So that's the condition we need. So, I mean, I guess most of you are very familiar with that. And there's been a previous talk on log canonical thresholds. So let me just recall the analytic point of view on log canonical threshold because that's what will appear later on. So in general, if I have a divisor D, the zero locus of alpha, to define its log canonical threshold, I can look at this function Z of beta and get here. And I can think of uh, beta as being defined in, in the complex plane because this function will be meromorphic uh, and all the poles will be on the negative real axis. And the first pool, pool here, here is actually minus the log canonical threshold from the analytic point of view. So the point is that for beta positive, it's of course finite. And then you go let beta be slightly negative and all is fine and you go on. And at some point you will hit the pole and that's the minus the log canonical threshold from the analytic point of view. So actually back in the 70s, at Engel fund Bernstein, they showed that uh, this really has isolated rational poles uh, on the negative axis. And uh, such functions, zeta beta, are nowadays often called Archimedean zeta functions because if you do this over uh, in the Piadic version, you will get uh, zeta functions which look very much like yeah, the sort of uh, more familiar algebra geometric zeta functions like Motovic ones and so on, but I will not go into to, uh, to that here. We're really interested in this uh, non arch oh, I mean, in the, in the Archimedean setting. Uh, okay, so let's uh, translate this into to this probabilistic uh, setup. So I have, I already have, remember I have alpha, which is the determinant one over k uh, on, x to the n k and, and the uh, alpha k here and then the the canonical divisor is the zero locus it's an anti-canonical uh, q divisor um so now i fix i want to integrate over x with so i fix some reference volume form dv uh, and, and then i define this uh, uh, sort of the z of beta by just the absolute value of alpha with respect to the induced metric uh, raised to the power of beta. Okay, so the definition has been made so that when we plug in beta equal to minus one, we get our the normalizing constant we're interested in. But, but allowing some beta which could be close to zero will be useful later on. Okay, so because we know by basic properties of log canonical thresholds that uh, the log canonical threshold, it may not be as big as one, which we would really like, but at least it's bigger than some constant uh, 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 minus beta zero, uh, which is uniform in N. So that's a basic uh, property if you look at just the Tian's alpha invariant. Uh, so what that, concretely means is that even if the normalizing constant is not finite, if I sneak in some beta, which is not minus one, but sufficiently close to zero, then it will be finite. So you can think of beta as some regularization parameter. So it, actually, if you look at the estimates, you will see that you really get the quantitative estimate in this case. So really the growth in N is just like some 
c to the n. Basically, that's because you, it iterates an integral over the n full product. Okay. But in general, such an estimate cannot hold down to beta equal to minus, minus one, at least according to the conjecture, because in that case, uh, we would expect uh, x to admit the Kalash metric, which is not always the case. So, you, there, so this can actually be shown rigorously. So if we assume that there exists some epsilon bigger than one, such that these normalizing constants are finite with the expected growth, uh, so you really get down to minus one here, uh, and the pole will be later on, then x actually uh, admits a unique Kedar-Einstein metric. And actually, so I will come back to a result by Fujita and Udaka, that you, will be able, you don't need to assume the growth condition even. Let's come back to that later. Okay, but even if we, okay, so what I'm saying is that under some reasonable assumption on the normalizing constant, uh, we know that there will be a Einstein metric, but then we'd expect to recover it from these random points. So is that really uh, gonna happen? Uh, so I have a small result in that direction. Uh, so what I can prove is that, is that if we add a hypothesis, which I call the zero-free hypothesis. Uh, and the zero-free hypothesis, then it works. So the zero-free hypothesis is that not only there, I assume that there is no pool, pole down to minus one, uh, but let's assume that there is a whole neighborhood of minus one, which is end of, independent of n, where there are no zeros. So the zeta function, I assume, has no zeros. So you'd say that, hold on, that's pretty obvious because the zeta function is this impost integral of a positive quantity, so for sure it's non-zero on the real axis. But the assumption is that the neighborhood can be chosen independent of n. So that's the assumption. Okay, so if we make this hypothesis, then the echo distribution actually holds. Uh, but I have no idea how one could verify this in general, even though I seem somehow seems reasonable to expect it's true. Uh, so that's sort of a technical hypothesis for the moment. Okay, so let's come back to, to, to stability, to make the connection to case stability. So I recall that this probability measure is well-defined if and only if the normalizing constant is finite, which algebraically means that log canonical threshold of the now this divisor is strictly bigger than one. So if this is the case, let's say that X is Gibbs stable. So the, the, the Gibbs name will uh, be explained later on. But there's also a natural stronger notion, which is perhaps more relevant. Uh, and in, the stronger notion is that we assume not only that it's bigger than one for, for any K, but there is a strict lower bound uniform bound when k tends to infinity. Uh, then we call x uniformly uh, Gibbs stable then. Okay, so the algebraic version of the conjecture, so without any conversion statement, that will be just a statement about algebraic geometry, is that if x is a fan of variety, then Gibbs stable should be equivalent to k stable. That's the first conjecture and uniformly Gibbs stable should be equivalent to uniformly case stable. Okay. And there is a beautiful result of uh, Fujita and Udakia, which uh, uh, is a refinement of a previous result of Fujita, that if you assume X is uniformly Gibbs stable, then X is actually uniformly case stable. And then actually we know by the solution of the Yautan Donaldson conjecture that there is a Keller Einstein metric. So that's very satisfactory. Uh, but I should say that the, the converse seems uh, very hard, uh, but uh, a very interesting problem. So let me just say that the really elegant proof is to show that, you, that the limb inf of the log canonical thresholds when k tends to infinity, which we assume are big, strictly bigger than one, uh, if we have uniform Gibbs stability, that they are bound from above by another 
invariant that uh, uh, Fujita and Udake introduced. They call the delta of x, which is a sort of evaluative invariant of x, which has uh, been studied a lot since their work. Uh, it's also called stability threshold more recently. And the connection to case stability is that x is uniformly case stable if and only if this delta invariant is strictly bigger than one. So if the left hand side is strictly bigger than one, then uh, the delta invariant will be strictly bigger than one, and that's why x is uniformly case stable. But what I would expect is that this is really an equality. Uh, but that seems completely open in general. Okay, so that was the algebraic side. Uh, okay, so I hope you're not too tired. I will get something to drink. Okay, so if you're not too tired, I will say something about the proof strategy. Yeah, how you go about proving these things. So let's come back to the case where kx is strictly positive, where, where and the theorem holds. So to get started, we'll fix some reference volume form on x. Any old volume form will do. And then I can rewrite the probability measure using this volume form as, that I've sneaked in as a reference. And then I just use the, the, the induced metric on the, the canonical line bundle, which depends on dv. Okay, because if I do that, I can rewrite my probability measure in this exponential form uh, by just defining en to be minus the scaled logarithm of uh, alpha squared with beta equal to one. Okay, so you may say, why would you want to do that? It's just completely tautological. How can that be of any help whatsoever? Um, but the point is that now we can look at this probability measure and make the connection to statistical mechanics. Because what we have here is precisely the equilibrium distribution of n interacting particles on X. Um, at uh, inverse temperature beta fixed. And En will then be the energy of the interaction per particle. Okay, so then we can use some intuition from, from statistical mechanics. So my favorite, so if, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've seen, many of you have seen this before, but my favorite example is to just think about uh, air so what's, or fog. So it consists of a lot of uh, oxygen molecules, for example, uh, and they are pulled down towards Earth by gravity. So you may say, hold on, uh, that's bad because all the molecules we should fall down and just be at the surface of Earth, uh, which would be pretty bad for humanity, right? But what's saving us is that there is also temperature. So air will have a non-zero temperature. I mean, it will not be at zero Kelvin. Uh, and even if it's pretty cold in Sweden, sometimes that's not as cold as it gets. Um, so that means that concretely, because we're not just looking at the minima of the energy, because we have a volume in the configuration space. So there will be a balance between sort of mid going towards smaller energy while steep keeping the volume rather large. And the volume uh, logarithmic is measured by entropy. So what we see in the configuration here of air is really something which is minimizing energy minus entropy, which is called the free energy. That's what we experience and that's what's saving us from so that we <laughs> from dying right uh, okay so let's try to make this a bit more general so we can use it um, so now i have a situation of n particles which with some really complicated interactions so then they're interacting uh, but let's assume that uh, at least we can say the following let's assume that 
this complicated energy, which depends on the number of particles, that it can be approximated by just some fixed energy functional of the empirical measure. So all the independence is not hidden into mu up to some small term. Uh, so then E of mu will be called the microscopic energy. So if we make this assumption, uh, which is called the mean field uh, approximation sometimes in the physical literature, then at the physics level of rigor at least, you would get convergence in probability of this random empirical measure towards the minimizer of the corresponding free energy functional. So again, the free energy is beta times the microscopic energy minus the, the entropy. So I'm using the physics uh, sign notation here. So that the entropy of mu will be minus the logarithm of mu times mu basically with respect to dv. And then we'll get convergence if we assume also that the free energy has a unique minimizer. So that's the sort of physics uh, uh, analogy we want to exploit, at least heuristically. Okay, so let's look at the complicated energy expression we have. It's defined to be minus the scale logarithm of uh, the absolute value of alpha. And that turns out, if you look at it, to be strongly repulsive. So it's as if these particles are, are uh, being re repulsive. There's a repulsion between any two particles. Because alpha is defined to be a, a determinant. And if two points coincide, then the determinant will be zero. Uh, but then the energy will be infinite. Uh, so that's... Uh, uh, repulsive behavior. But the big question then is that can we really find some microscopic energy functional uh, which uh, approximates this complicated microscopic interaction? That's the physics point of view. But how do we find this E of mu? Okay, so it turns out that this can be done. So the first step is that there is such a functional E of mu, and it's actually the pluricomplex energy, which uh, sort of goes back to, to my joint work with Sebastian Buxon and David Wittnerstrom on conversions of fake to points. Uh, and it was further expanded uh, in, uh, in other work, but, but the point is that there is such a functional uh, and, and it's a pluricomplex energy. And the proof of this convergence is basically based on, on our work uh, on fake points. Okay, so that's good. We have a, a microscopic energy. And the step two, which is really the, the hardest technical point, is to show that this physics intuition, that you can then apply the free energy principle, it really applies in this situation. You can prove it with all the epsilons and everything. Uh, even if it took me several years, actually, but it, it actually works. Uh, and step three is to make sure that there is a unique minimizer of the corresponding free energy. So the free energy now will be beta times the pluricomplex energy minus the entropy. So we want uh, the conversion towards the minimizer. For that, we need to know that it's unique and then it's exactly the coincides with the Kelanstein volume form. And that turns out to work. That's not so complicated because by magic, uh, you can identify this corresponding free energy with Mabuch's K energy functional, uh, that it's unique uh, minimizer is the Keller-Einstein metric. So these are the three steps which go into the, uh, the proof. Uh, yeah. Okay, so let's move on to the 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 case where minus k x, minus kx is positive, so x fan of. Okay, so well, it's very similar. The only difference is that now difference is that beta is now minus one. Okay, that's quite strange. Negative absolute temperature. But you can think about it in a different way. You can really set beta equal to one, 
but you change the sign of the energy interaction. So somehow we have the same situation, but in the opposite case where the interaction energy is, is attracted. But for this formal physics argument, that makes no difference. As you'd expect the result to hold, but of course the devil is in the details, as you know, because the, it turns out that technically it's much harder. Uh, so, but still, I mean, it's not completely desperate. So before thinking about the case when beta is minus one, let's take any beta which is positive. Not just before we had beta equal to one, but let's take any positive beta. Well then, actually everything works exactly as before. So in the previous argument of Kx plus positive, I never used that beta was one, only positive. You have a repulsive interaction, you get a unique minimizer, and in the limit you recover some. So this random measure uh, in the large n limit, it will be equal to the minimizer f dv beta of the free energy. And it turns out that you can look at the minimizer and see that the corresponding Kähler metric, uh, the critical point equa equation for the minimizer is just this equation uh, um, involving the Ricci curvature, which coincides with Aubin's continuity equation if you think about time as minus beta. So just let, so if beta were minus one, then this is indeed the keller einstein equation as we would expect. Uh, so this is a sort of a probabilistic point of view on Aubin's continuity method. Um, okay, so to wrap up, I mean, for beta, so, 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 okay, but, okay, or actually, let's see what we can do for negative beta. So if we assume that the keller einstein metric exists, then you look at this, the beta dependence of, of this curve of, of metrics, omega beta. So it turns out that this is actually a real analytic curve. For beta equal to minus one, it's the Keller-Einstein metric because this is the Keller-Einstein equation. Okay, but the problem is we can only prove convergence towards omega beta when, when beta is positive, but then it's analytic in beta. So maybe we can use some analytic continuation. I mean, that sounds maybe promising, but there is a big but. So even if we understand completely beta positive from the physics point of view, there could be a phase transition. So when we go through zero beta, maybe the system behaves in a suddenly in a completely different way. Uh, like in this picture of a phase transition of water uh, to ice, right? So somehow what we need to do is to rule out the phase transition. And that's really the, the idea of this zero free hypothesis that I made in theorem two. Because if you make this zero free hypothesis, then this, you can really do an on argument using an analytic continuation of the, of the, of the sort of proof from beta positive to beta equal to minus one. So, and so maybe I should just say why that is so, okay, maybe here. So the point, the pro, if you think of, oops, the problem is really on the following form. So we're interested in some partition function, zeta n of beta, uh, but in the limit, we need to divide by n. If you remember, there was a growth in n. And we want to think of this as a holomorphic function in beta. As, so we have some sequence of holomorphic functions. Oops, sorry, no, n root from the log. Yeah, so we sort of want to look at this as a holomorphic function, uh, f n beta. But then we really need to, for this to be well defined, when we take the n root, we want this thing here to be not equal to zero. So that's why technically this condition comes in. And we want this to be a sequence that lives on some neighborhood, which is independent of n. Uh, okay, so again, to make, to wrap up the seminar and the talk, I, I need to make the connection to, to physics again in phase transition. So this is a very common hypothesis in the physics literature, which is basically called the Li-Yang property. Uh, so the idea is that by controlling the zeros of the partition function, you control the large n limit. And if you think of the, the, this as a function of beta, it's usually called Fisher zeros uh, in the physics literature. 
So you may wonder, I mean, okay, so this zero free hypothesis, are there cases where it has been verified? And indeed there are many cases, uh, sort of model cases where it has been verified. So for example, if you look at the spin system, so like this, so you have spins po pointing up or down, uh, then it can be shown that uh, the zero free property, it holds down to the critical uh, inverse temperature where you have spontaneous magnetization, which is a phase transition. So in that case, there is, you can really see that the phase transition really comes, appears when you have a concentration of zeros, like in this picture. So basically, so what we need to show here in our situation then is that the, there is no concentration of zeros down to around minus one. So, so if there is a phase transition, we want to make sure that it appears later on. Okay, so that's the connection to physics. Uh, right, so okay, let me just conclude then with a cliffhanger. Um, so th there are some connections to quantum gravity uh, that we studied in a joint work with Tristan Collins and Daniel Passion. And the paper should appear tomorrow on the archives. Uh, so that's a cliffhanger. So in that case, uh, the fan appears as a base of a Calabi outcome. Um, okay, so thanks a lot uh, for listening. I will turn on the camera. So thank you very uh, much. Okay, let's see if I can turn on the camera now. Uh, whoops, so any questions, more questions? Yes. Any questions? Yes. Let me see. Can you see me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so anyway, I should say, if you're watching this as a video, uh, just, I mean, you can always write me an email or we can chat on, on Zoom, some other, other occasion. The, I have a question. So, uh, in case yeah. you get some uh, uh, unstable uh, Fano, is there, uh, do you expect yeah. that uh, the, there can happen this uh, tra uh, phase transition uh, in this process uh, that have some geometric yeah, right. need of? Uh... Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, so, I mean, first of all, I think that there is a, another connection because, yeah, actually, let me, uh, actually, I will use, I will stop the video and write, I can go into the, the whiteboard move mode. Uh, let me see if I stop share and I go into the whiteboard. Uh, so, whoops, oops. If I, no, it's not working. Yeah, oh, it's not working. Oh, no. now you can see. Yeah. Yeah. Now yes. Sir. Yeah. Now, good. So yeah, so basically, so we're interested in this uh, sort of normalizing constant. Uh, and so basically you have something like, which looks like one over the determinant to the pi or one over K. And then to the power beta. Well, actually, no, I put the mic, sorry. <laughs> Uh, there is a the beta is can be the way I normalize things. It's this is the determinant mm -hmm. to the power beta. And the problem is if if beta is negative, then this could diverge, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and if it's unstable, so unstable, that should sort of mean that the critical beta is is sort of is is before minus one, mm -hmm. more or less. Yeah. Uh, so, so the first thing I would expect is that if this happens, it's, so then it means that this integral will be equal to infinity, but then we should be able to, to, to look at where, uh, which part of the zero locus is responsible for the divergence. Mm -hmm. And I would expect that this is sort of totally at least equivalent to just the nth uh, power of some, uh, maybe not submanifold, but 
uh, some valuation mm -hmm. in some sense. So I would expect that when n tends to infinity, you can sort of extract uh, some valuation which is responsible for the divergence, and I would expect it to be pretty closely related to other evaluative objects. Uh, I see. Uh, for sure. So that's so that's one. But then the, your question is: Can we also look at? So somehow, what should happen here is that from the zeta function point of view, is that we have a pole here, some critical beta. Uh, where this pole happens. And the question we would expect then that maybe we have some concentration of zeros. Mm -hmm. um, so that I'm not sure about. So actually, mm -hmm. um, so actually, that's a bit subtle. So I think that in the cases I've looked at, the funny thing is that there are actually no zeros at all. So somehow the zero free hypothesis is very strongly satisfied. So I don't think uh, in this case uh, uh, the, the zeros have any, uh, any meaning. I see. Because the reason somehow, if you compare with spin systems, the difference is that because of this strong attractive nature we have here, uh, you can have a different kind of phase transition, which means that it's so, the phase transition is so strong that even the partition function diverges, which is never the case. For, for the sort of simplest physical systems. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so, so I think that the zero free hypothesis is really uh, just a technical assumption, which maybe could even hold very strongly in the sense that there are no zeros whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. Mm So thanks. Are there any other questions? So hi, Robert. Yeah, hi, Yuji. Hi, hi Yuji. Ah, hi. Did so I turn on the camera. Or no, actually, never mind. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. I... go on, go on. Uh, Nancy. Yeah, actually, let me turn on the camera. It's complicated with the iPad. Uh... Okay, let me see. You see me now? Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> see you. But you disappeared. Oh, I disappeared. Yeah. Yeah. I think. Okay. Never mind. You're, you're hiding oh, the camera. Because I have my hand. Against... Okay. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Uh, anyway. On. So, uh, sorry, I'm not uh, or probably understanding this statistics uh, well, details. But uh, so you you still uh, believe this uh, uniform Gibbs is uh, so how how you guess this uh, uniform Gibbs is actually. Um, given this case, W D. So yeah, the converse direction. Yeah. So how how to prove the converse? Well, uh, um, so I think that the best yeah. argument, uh, which is in favor of the conjecture, uh -huh. is really from the non-Archimedean point of view. So, so but that so I didn't explain that, but. I mean, this this whole thing with zeta functions and so on is just a technical tool, which is probably not, I mean, the important thing. It's just the way, the only way I can prove something by making this assumption. But if so, if in my paper, uh, invitation to random, I mean, Kelanshan metrics and random point process, mm -hmm. says, um, I actually explained that there is another more, I mean, technical condition, which is an energy bound uh, that needs to hold. Uh, for convergence. And the funny thing is that if you just translate that into a non-Archimedean statement, uh, then uh, one just needs to prove some sort of a, an energy bound. You think of this, the determinant uh, here thing. Uh, if you think of this as a, as a non-Archimedean object in terms of, or you think of X with a trivial valuation uh, on K, uh, then one can formulate uh, uh, something which, uh, I mean, the only thing one would need to prove. So I'm, I have sort of a work slow in progress with Sebastian Buxon and Matthias Jonsson on this, which makes the connection to this non-Archimedean pluripotential theory we've been using. Um, and I'm not convinced that that's actually a feasible way of proving it, but at least it, it opens, I mean, 
uh, it's a door one. I mean, uh, uh, some route more. one could follow. Yeah. And, and the funny thing is that, it, I mean, that if you just, I, I've checked the case of log fan curves. I think, yeah, I think even, I mean, it, it appears in the work of Kento before. Uh, but then everything can be worked out and uniform GIP stability is equivalent to GIP stability is equivalent to case stability. Of course, the, the case of curves is very special. But the funny thing is that even if it's special, uh, when you look, I mean, at the energy bound, it's not, it doesn't look simple in that case. But somehow it has to hold because there's another way of proving it. So it's somehow showing that it's not completely desperate, I think. <laughs> Does that make any sense? So you're, from your physics viewpoint, so you have some heuristic explanation that yeah. should... <laughs> yeah, I mean, the phys yeah, but that's just, I mean, that's just heuristic. So, you know, I mean, it's, uh -huh. That's, are, still, that's interesting. But, but, but I think that this non archimedean point of view is more, if you yeah, give a way, tec a technical mm -hmm. uh, way of attacking the, the problem. So we're looking into that. Hopefully it will give something. It also gives a sort of another way to, to understand your proof. There is a sort of a non a pluripotential way of understanding your direction of the conjecture, where you show that uniform git stability implies uniform case stability. Oh, can do, yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, hopefully we'll be able to write something about that eventually. I see. Okay, thank you. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? So a quick question: in the case of yeah. uh, of automorphism, when there are automorphisms. Uh, uh, yeah. What happened? That's very that's very intriguing. So I swept that under the rug, yeah. But you, you noticed probably that I avoided that. So actually, let's say something about that. So if I, let me see, I erase this, clear my drawing. Yeah, it got erased, right? You can see, yeah. Uh, so yeah, let me see if I can, okay. I, I need to erase the camera if I'm using the iPad. Here, stop video. Okay, okay, let me see. So big. Basically, that's um, so. What is a bit intriguing is that if you look at look at this integral uh, of this uh, one over alpha watch one over alpha bar. So, if if this is fi finite, uh, then I expect then in the statement my conjecture is that conjecture is that there is a unique Kellogg metric. Because actually, this conjecture, I mean, what, what if even, I mean, regardless of the conjecture, what is certainly true is that the finiteness actually implies that there are that the, the, the infinitesimal automorphisms, that there are no non trivial infinitesimal automorphisms. Uh, so that's something I can prove that there is no way that there could be, if, the, if this integral is finite, that actually implies uh, the, that there are no holomorphic vector fields. Uh, so, so that's actually a funny argument that because if basically what one can show is that using this finiteness of, of x to the n, one proves because of this is completely canonical, you show that this actually implies that there's canonical volume form, that it's so canonical, it's even infinitesimal, I mean, it's invariant under holomorphic vector fields. Mm -hmm. But that can never happen. So that's why uh, it cannot be finite. But then the question is, what? I mean, what is the sort of uniform poly GIP stability? And that seems completely uh, intriguing. The only case that I've been able to understand is a toric case that I'm planning to to write up. In that case, one can, because of the toric structure, one can sort of understand what is the notion of equivariant uniform uh, GIP stability. Mm. So with respect to the sum that works. So that that I can it's a bit technical, so I'm not going into that here. Yeah. But what is comp oops, what is comp what I would I mean that would be great if somebody could figure out what is the how to incorporate some, for example, equivariance with respect to a compact subgroup uh, into the setup. That would be really uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So uh, it's uh, 
So actually, that's also related. And from the physics point of view, it's like you have a symmetry that, and you need to break it somehow. Yeah. Uh, but there is no canonical way of breaking it. I on, I only in the sort of toric case, you can use a toric structure to break it, mm -hmm. as far as I understand. I see. Uh, but that, that would be really, I mean, it's like, I mean, what, I mean, maybe, I mean, people have thought about this from the algebraic point of view. We have sort of have some log canonical threshold. And it's not, let's say you have a device. Yeah, so let's think about the, you have a divisor in some variety, uh, X, and the log canonical threshold is, is, is not, it's actually one, but sort of strictly positive if you rule out some natural uh, equivariant objects. I don't know, is there a sort of a notion of being KLT modulo some group, uh, compact subgroup. I don't know. Anybody? <laughs> no. So if you know, then maybe you, you, you're you're fit to work on this. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thanks. So yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Thanks a lot. I'll... Yeah. If yeah, thanks a lot. So if not. Uh, yes, yeah, so we can probably terminate here, I guess. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, thank you very much for the nice talk and okay. uh, see and see you. <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah. See Bye. you. Bye. 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 <laughs>